Yesterday, October 17, 2011, 3.8 million patients saw their doctor. Why was that? Was it the flu? No. It turns out 3.8 million patients see their doctor every day. This is something that we've been doing for a couple thousand years or so now. And that story of doctors and patients is a pretty interesting one. And it's filled with tales of reinvention. And I'm going to tell you that story here this morning. So first, I think we can all agree that pain and disease are a universal human experience. The word patient actually comes from the Latin patior, which means I suffer. Coping with disease and suffering led not only to the birth of medicine, but also religion and philosophy. Now, back in the beginning, you didn't need me. If you fell sick, your entire community came together to help you. That is because the health of your group, the survival of your group, of your clan, depended on everyone being healthy. So back then, sickness was very much a public matter. It was a social condition with social solutions. Compare that with today. In our age of HIPAA, where sickness and disease is such an intensely private matter. It's true. Now, back then in Paleolithic times, it turns out we were relatively free from pestilence. In fact, you might have died young, but you died because something ate you, not because you had some disease. <laughs> disease is a side effect of civilization. Most of our diseases come from the animals that we domesticated. Our cattle brought us tuberculosis and smallpox. Our chicken and pigs gave us influenza. The horse, the common cold, even the dog, man's best friend, so-called, <laughs> shared 65 diseases with us. Now, it was living with these domesticated animals and in civilizations and big groups that we lived in the filth of cholera, diphtheria, hepatitis. And this, of course, was great, because for the first time, you guys needed me. Right? The first time in our civilization, we needed doctors. And here I am, in early civilization, a god. <laughs> I'm Asclepius, the god of healing. Those were the good days, right? <laughs> you didn't come to my office, you came to my temple. <laughs> you wanted my help, you knelt down before me first. Compare that with today. I've been reduced to a restaurant review on Yelp. <laughs> His hands were cold, two stars. <laughs> so the physician as God thing was not to last. And around the fifth century BCE, we reinvented ourselves for the first time, thanks to Hippocrates. Hippocrates said that sickness is not a cosmic matter, but rather a natural one. This was a very important distinction, because for the first time, we could study nature and understand the causes and treatments for disease. That secular split led to the foundation of Western medicine as we know it today. And to mark this reinvention, we wrote an oath, the Hippocratic Oath, which all of the physicians in the room today will recognize. Do you know why? Because we took this oath thousands of years ago, and we still take this oath in medical school today. This oath separated us from the other so-called healers. And by professing this oath, we became the first professionals. These were good days for us, for a while. But then, civilizations grew, diseases spread. Have you ever heard of a plague of biblical proportions? That's because for the next thousand years or so, we were struck down by plague after plague after plague. Malaria brought down the Roman Empire, followed by smallpox, typhus, influenza, and everyone's favorite, the bubonic. These diseases annihilated hundreds of millions of humans. 
And despite all our professing, all we doctors could hope to do was premium non nocere, which is Latin for first do no harm. That's all we could do, do no harm. We were worthless. You no longer needed us. And it was around this time that the church stepped in with its saints and holy waters and relics. It took up the cause of coping with disease and sickness. Once again, disease and sickness became a cosmic problem. Because even if the church could not cure you, it promised that your suffering is not in vain. You'll be rewarded in the afterlife. We had no good counteroffer. <laughs> But not to be outdone, during the bubonic years, we got together. We talked about it. We reinvented ourselves. This is what we came up with scary costumes. No, really, that was it. Scary costumes. That's all we had. <laughs> This was not a successful reinvention. But fortunately, the storm clouds of the plagues cleared, societies reformed, and once again, we were able to reinvent. We cast out the surgeons or the barbers, for your surgeon and your barber were one and the same. Did you know that? Amputation or haircut, take your pick. We cast out the apothecaries who went on to become pharmacists, and we decided that to be a physician, you must be a university trained man. Only gentlemen obviously had the means and time to apply. But this was important because at university, we studied the science of medicine, we taught each other, and we taught our patients. And for the first time, we became doctors from the Latin tocere, which means I teach. That's the root of doctors, I teach. So this went right into the days of the Jane Austen physician. Well mannered and dressed, visiting the sick at home, right? We'd stop by the drawing room, maybe for a cup of tea, then up to the bedroom to visit you, the sick in bed. We'd ascertain the pulse, check the tongue, and then ask you and the family what you wanted. This was the first patient centered care because. What we did, either a drop of morphine or some bloodletting, was more based on what it was that you asked for rather than what we thought. It didn't really matter much anyway. Our black bags were filled with blanks. What counted was bedside manner. And these were halcyon days for us. You loved us, you needed us, and it dovetailed right into the Age of Enlightenment. Being university men, we were at the right place at the right time. Science of the 19th and 20th centuries finally filled our bags with useful tools. Now we were firing on all cylinders. We had microscopes, otoscopes, stethoscopes, and only we knew how to use them. We were patient centered, caring, and effective. The generalist practitioner who could meet all of your needs. This is right up into the days of Marcus Welby, MD. We were your heroes. End of chapter. What happened next? We let our arrogance reinvent us. We knew 10,000 diseases and we had cures for all of them. If you were sick and you were suffering, you had to come see me. Our new motto became Nantes sum et salvum non osculum Nantes, which is Latin for I'm here to save your ass, not to kiss it. It really is. <laughs> we thought we were gods again. But the very advances that brought us such success became our downfall. Where once you needed our expertise, our technologies now replaced us. Where it used to take great skill to diagnose strep throat or diabetes or pregnancy, now anyone could swab a throat. Take a drop of blood or pee on a stick, and you'd have a precise diagnosis. Precision medicine or technical medicine had replaced intuitive medicine. And precision medicine, with its MRI scans and immunofluorescence and genetic testing, was far more accurate than even the most successful physician. This completely disrupted our role. 
Where it used to be, to diagnose a murmur, you had to use a stethoscope. And it takes years to master this. Any physicians in the room can tell you that. This is very difficult to master. Now you can diagnose a murmur with your iPhone. <laughs> Thank you, Steve Jobs. <laughs> really. So what does this mean? This means that now my niece can diagnose a mitral valve murmur, and she's six. Soon we'll diagnose melanoma with just the click of a photo. Right? No more difficult than, than taking an Instagram. That technology is almost here. It's very close. Where it used to be that to understand about your disease, you had to come see me. What about now? The, the internet has made that information freely available to you. Knowledge that used to be only on my bookshelves, you can now get on WebMD, the Mayo Clinic. Your patient communities can actually give you information that even I don't have. Now you patients track your own health. You demand your data back from us. You saw chiropractors, naturopaths, and other alternative health providers twice as often as you came to see us. The outlook doesn't look good for our protagonist, does it? That's me, the doctor. We're the, we're the protagonist. <laughs> But let us not forget, we've been through a thousand years of sickness and disease together. And through that, we've always been there for you. As smart as it is, Google is not your doctor. Facebook cannot touch you. Twitter cannot allay your fears. When your patient community tells you about a new treatment for your cancer, who gives you the chemotherapy and keeps you alive when you're at your lowest point? We do. When your child is turning blue from asthma, who doesn't panic? As we're trained to do, remain calm and restores his breathing. We do. When your Google search for muscle twitching turns up ALS as it does, it's a devastating neurologic condition. Who reassures you that you don't have it? We do. If any one of you were to fall sick here today, who would be the first to respond before EMS ever got here? One of the physicians in this room. For you are patients. And when you're a patient, you suffer. And we physicians all have answered the call to serve you. We will reinvent ourselves. We will, for the first time, become content creators creating videos, blog posts, podcasts, getting back to our roots of doctors as teachers. We will once again visit you at home. This time, we'll meet up virtually, right? You'll bring your knowledge that you gleaned from the internet. You'll bring your network. You might even bring your own diagnosis, and then you will as Hippocrates had said thousands of years ago, cooperate with the physician in combating disease. We'll use electronic medical records to communicate with other doctors and with you. You'll email me, I'll text you back. That's right. We'll use technologies such as tele telemedicine and teledermatology empower primary care physicians to act as specialists. For the first time, your general practitioner will once again be able to meet all of your needs. And those who have not been able to access us will be able to access us by us leveraging these technologies. We will empower you. We will embrace your networks like Cure Together and ours like CERMO. All the while, working as teams, collaborating to keep you well. We will not be one of many generic healthcare providers. We will be doctors. And medicine will once again return as it was a social collaborative problem with social collaborative solutions. 
Now, I've told you the beginning and the middle of this story, but not the end. That'll be for some future TED speaker, maybe you. But for me, I must end here. Thank you. Thank you.